This is Marking Out. Pro Wrestling Talk by Pro Wrestling Fans. We Marking Out, y'all. Follow on Twitter. Pro Wrestling Talk by Pro Wrestling Fans. We Marking Out, y'all. Marking Out. Pro Wrestling Talk by Pro Wrestling Fans. We Marking Out, y'all. Spread it like this. Pro Wrestling Talk by Pro Wrestling Fans. We Marking Out, y'all. We Marking Out. Pro Wrestling Talk by Pro Wrestling Fans. Welcome to Marking Out. Pro Wrestling Talk by Pro Wrestling Fans. I am one of your hosts, Dave the Rave. You can check me, Brandon, and Chris over at MarkingOut.com. Make sure that you listen and subscribe and download over at Spotify, Apple Podcasts, or wherever else you may be downloading your podcast. Give us a five-star rating. Buy a t-shirt, ProWrestlingTees.com slash MarkingOut. Give us a follow on Twitter at Marking Out. Give us also a like on Facebook. And check us out on Instagram at Marking Out 11. Also, we are on TikTok, Twitch, and wherever else you can find us on social media, make sure you find us. This is episode 678. And this is not just episode 678. This is the Taylor Swift anniversary. That's right. It is the 13-year anniversary of Marking Out. I know, I didn't think we were going to make it this long either, but you know what? We might as well keep on going. Let's hit 20 years. But thank you very much for listening. We appreciate each and every one of you. Sincerely from all of us, thank you. We love you. Thank you for always listening to us. But follow me on Social media platforms at David PTDPT. Follow Chris over on Twitter at Chris Sweendog and CM Sweeney85 on Instagram. And follow Brandon at BTTG161. That being said, Brandon, how are you today? I'm still not doing awesome as always, but I tested negative for COVID today, so that's a positive. Hey, that is awesome. Nice, nice. Yeah. Okay, congrats. How was your week? It sucks. After we recorded last week, I lost my sense of smell and taste. So that absolutely sucked because the last time I had COVID, that didn't happen. The first time it happened, and it took me two months to recover from that. But thankfully, I'm able to smell and taste some things now. All right, that's good that so it came back. It wasn't like I'm gonna knock on some wood. It wasn't as extreme as that. That yeah, the the first time at least. Mm -hmm. But my aunt and uncle brought me some food on Sunday, which was dope. My aunt makes the best like French toast casserole, so she brought that and she made her mac and cheese too, which was so good. So I'm very grateful for that. And that's really all I did this week was have that food. I didn't. I couldn't do anything. I had like such low energy. That's cool. I gotta. I should have given you a somehow. You know those old school um, photographs that you can look through the like you would get from a hotel that you would look through a little, a little yeah, um, like a kaleidoscope gimmick. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I have one of your aunt and uncle. I don't know how. I think my grandma had it. So I gotta give it to you to give to them next time you see them. <laughs> I'm not too sure what hotel it was at. Um, but yeah, so putting that out there. So this way I remember. And so do you, <laughs> well, I, that's but, not going to help me remember anything, but how was your week? My week was good. You know, my week was good. Um, just really exciting weekend with the Royal Rumble that covered really a lot of my weekend. I was very much so looking forward to it. So let's talk about it. The Royal Rumble took place uh, Tropicana Field in Florida, Tampa Bay. Big difference from, from the last time to this time. Yeah, big difference. Full house. Full we house. We had Michael Cole, Corey Graves, and Pat McAfee do commentary. Pat McAfee was not a surprise to Michael Cole this time. He was a surprise for the, the viewing audience, so it was nice to have him there. Yeah, a lot of people were bashing... Uh, Pat McAfee, like his commentating skills on that and Monday Night Raw. I don't know why. That's weird. Yeah. I, I, I didn't it, see any of that. I saw a lot on Twitter and actually on Instagram too. I don't know why because to me it seemed like he was good. 
Yeah, I like Pat. Yeah, I, I didn't see the big problem with everything. But, yeah, so the Royal Rumble kicked off with the women's Royal Rumble matchup with our winner being Bailey. Um, what were some of your favorite parts of this match? First of all, right off the bat, we're waiting for number one to come out. It's Natalia. And then number two, big surprise, big return, Naomi. So I thought that was pretty cool. And then Michael Cole, on her entrance, mentioned that she won the Knockouts Championship in her time away from WWE. Which was interesting that they mentioned that. Bailey was my pick. She was out number three. So it was cool to see the three of them work together. We saw Jordan Grace show up as the Knockouts Champion at number five. I mean, this is... So, if, you, if there was any foreshadowing from that Michael Cole comment, I know you were unfortunately spoiled, which is yes. very unfortunate that people put that out there, but... Yeah, I was really, really bummed that I was spoiled by that surprise because that's a huge surprise. Um, I do want to say that with Naomi coming back, I did love that she took a moment to, like, address the crowd... You know, like you could, like, well, not address, but take it all in. Um, right. And then to kick it off with Natalia, I thought that was really, it seemed like a very special moment. And then for Jordan Grace, when she got right in there, she looked right at no, uh, Naomi and they embraced each other and hugged each other because uh, Jordan Grace won the championship from Naomi. And, and they just, they I, did, they did, uh, what was it, Hard to Kill? They did the, TV taping, and then in the Royal Rumble itself. Mm-hmm. And I totally... I liked the, the the dueling banjos sort of situation between her and Ivy Nile, where it was like, like anything you could do, I could also do. Well, even, but just even like before that. that, even before that, with the Naomi and Jordan Grace, when they embrace each other, they're hugging each other, and then they just start throwing elbows at each other and punches. Yeah, yeah. Just to start where they left off. I marked out for that. I thought that was such a smart spot to have, you know. Yeah, Jordan just Grace was... looked phenomenal in that Royal Rumble. She yeah. looked so good in the Royal Rumble to the point where I would have been like, "Hello, Scott, can we book her for Monday Night Raw?" Yeah, obviously I was that didn't sur- happen. But I'm not too familiar with her, but she definitely was fantastic in the ring. Um, she definitely was a powerhouse in there. And I thought that it was awesome. I like damage control being in there all together. Mm-hmm. The, the spot where Kyrie Sane held on, uh, that blew my mind. Like, I don't, I watched that over and over again. That, that spot. <laughs> I don't, from, I still, I can't comprehend her, how, how she was able to do that. I know that, that Sane spot where she's just hanging on by her like fingertips. That just looks so painful. And I'm watching it. I'm like, there's no way in hell she's going to actually be able to get back into the ring unless Asuka helps her. Um, but then it really led to the downfall of Damage Control because she was eliminated from that spot and Asuka was like right behind her eliminated. Yeah. Which was very surprising um, because I thought that maybe they were going to have more of an impact on Bailey actually winning the Royal Rumble. Like I thought that they, Asuka and Sane were going to go a lot longer to help not to help, well, directly help Bailey, but to eliminate more and more people and protect Bailey in the Royal Rumble, but that didn't happen. And of course, there's there's speculation as to maybe the the spot with Kyrie wasn't supposed to happen because after that happens, you could see Oscar say, "Eliminate me," but that could just be her calling the spot that was supposed to happen. So I exactly. I can't say that anything was supposed to happen there. No, we did see Bianca Belair eliminate. Uh, Jordan Grace with the the KOD on the apron. I know they went back and forth. Uh, I mean, they were asked about it. Naomi was asked about it on the bump. People in interviews asked everybody about Jordan Grace. It would be pretty cool to see some sort of Worlds Collide event between TNA and, and WWE. Yeah, and I think that with Jordan Grace, they definitely, I feel like WWE and the women in that ring protected Jordan Grace as the Impact Wrestling, well, TNA champion, I feel like she was really protected very well because if there's somebody to eliminate her, Bianca Belair is a great person. It's not like she's being eliminated by uh, somebody that's not being utilized. 
She got eliminated by a former champion. And she, she got looked like hit. an absolute star. Exactly. And she got eliminated by the finisher on what's said to be the most hardest part of the ring. Huge we saw protection. Piper. We saw Piper Niven save Chelsea Green when Chelsea made her entrance. I mean, this and then was, I liked. Yeah. What? This was a funny throwback to last year where Chelsea Green broke the record for the women's Royal Rumble matchup with for elimination, and I thought that that was very funny how she almost got eliminated, but then she stayed in and then broke her record to stay in the ring, and then like you but said, they kept Piper having Niven accidents with one another. Yeah. And I thought that was really funny. But we saw Nia Jax and Becky Lynch go after each other. I think that was expected. Mm -hmm. We saw Valhalla make her entrance. And then R-Truth's music hits. He runs down, super confused at seeing Valhalla, gets into the ring, very confused as to where the men are. (laughs) Just before you go into that, I was surprised that Valhalla got eliminated so quickly. Well, that happens after that. R-Truth gets in the ring. Nia Jax eliminates him. And Adam Pierce makes R-Truth leave. Obviously, Valhalla gets in there. She gets out right away. She's pissed off at R-Truth. And she gets held back from, from going after him. And I thought we would maybe see her later in the Men's Royal Rumble to I, nah. sort of get some sort of revenge. How, how, was, she, there, how was she eliminated? I, don't, I think Nia Jax took her out. From a distraction? Five from seconds her? also. She's tied with Chelsea Green now. Oh, wow. Okay. So that's... Yeah, so that's, I thought that was an absolutely hilarious spot that our truth That was, was huge. And the crowd... With, I, thought, I thought you said this was the time. I thought that was funny. Yeah, that, that, was, that was totally hilarious. I think the crowd reaction to that spot was incredible, especially our truth going sliding into the ring and looking up and seeing Nia Jax just standing right in front of him. Just very, yeah. very funny spot. Um, Something that was spoiled on the kickoff show. Oh, yeah. Which, it's not not a huge spoiler, but she was in the Raw Rumble last year. She's booked for Vengeance Day. Roxanne Perez was in this Raw Rumble when they showed Randy Orton coming out on the kickoff show. They showed the background, and it was her Titantron. So you had to assume that Roxanne Perez was in it. I think she looked great. Uh... The, the next big entrant for this Royal Rumble at number 28 was the debut of Jade Cargill. What a star. I, I love from, she, the, from the... Before she even gets in the ring, I loved how she went out there and she just took her time. There was no... She didn't run to the ring. She didn't walk fast to the ring. She took a... It was just a power strut to the ring, taking her time. And it's like she was radiating dominance. And then when she got into the ring, I believe she just started to stare down Nia Jax, right? Yeah, and she she literally, she took uh, Nia Jax out. I know. The entire time where she went to body slam her and stuff, I was like, I was very, I was very nervous because I'm like, please don't drop her, don't let something happen to your leg or so, you know, because so much could happen when you're trying to do something like that. And as we see, should, kind of, well, that wasn't weight wise, but we saw that happen on, on uh, dynamite. I'll talk about. Yeah. I, I just didn't want any mishaps to happen. I wanted to look very clean and it did. Jade Cargill eliminated her. And then we got to see her stare down with Bianca Belair, which was before like, that though, Becky Lynch was super happy that, Nia Jax was eliminated. She was like laughing about it. I thought that was really funny. Yeah, she was standing right next to Jade. That was just such a sight to see her standing right next to Jade Cardgill. Yeah, and Jade kind of made a face like, you're kind of taking my spotlight here. Yeah, she's like, who are you? Yeah. And then we saw Tiffany Stratton enter at 29, and she looked like an absolute veteran in that Royal Rumble. Mm -hmm. That was fantastic. Liv Morgan made her return after many months at number 30. Like you had mentioned previously, just before we saw the, like the, I don't know why I'm saying dueling banjos. That's all I could think of saying with uh, Bianca Belair and Jade Cargill. Yeah. They, that, that whole setup with the, the press slams mm-hmm. and then the stare down. That's, I think there was I mean, installing when, suplex spots in there. 
when it was when it was mentioned even or even probably while she was in AEW, people were like, I would love to see Jade Cargill versus Bianca Belair. And then yeah. when it started to become a reality, they're like, Yes, I need to see Bianca Belair versus Jade Cargill. We get that little tease and it's like an instant people are like, Oh, I would like to see them as tag team champions, but also other people are like instant WrestleMania main event. So I thought that was fantastic. And I think Jade looked I would be the absolute first person to say Jade Cargill looked like trash if she looked like trash. Oh, yeah. Because yeah. I think you, a majority been, of her... You have been a big critic I've, of her. So if there was going to be Yeah, I think a majority to... of her stuff in AEW was not great. And and mm-hmm. also people say, oh, AEW dropped the ball with, with Jade Cargill. I don't think that's the case. Yeah. She was pretty much undefeated. Yeah. How did they drop the... Just because she signed somewhere else doesn't mean they dropped the ball with her. They 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 helped make maybe, her a I star. I could see maybe like dropping the ball as in like she left the company. That's she so- really, she, I mean, towards the end of her career in AEW, her time in AEW, she it was on the, the rumors of the website she was training with Brian Danielson every week before the shows. That seems like all she was doing. And now this is like she's been training, obviously, at the Performance Center. We know she's been training with Natalia and uh, Tyson Kidd. This is a different Jade Cargill to me. Yeah. She, didn't, she didn't look lost in the ring like some news reporters put out there. She looked confident. Absolutely. And she, she did, I, every spot that she hit, she looked like a megastar. I agree. She looked very confident. And I don't think... AEW dropped the ball with her. I think they they helped no, make I don't her. Think so either. They helped make her a superstar. She people forget about her streak and her dominance so quickly. I don't know why, but but um, again, her the matches she was having were not quality matches in my opinion. Most of yeah. them were not. But you but, know, but uh, this yeah, the, it, we saw Naomi last over an hour in this. She had set the record, but it came down to Bailey, Liv Morgan, and Jade Cargill. With the three of them out on the apron, and Liv Morgan hits the oblivion to Jade Cargill to take her out off the apron, and then Bailey gets that quick push off of the apron to Liv Morgan, and Bailey, because she was in there longer than Naomi at that point, broke the record. So she holds the record for the longest time being in there for the women. In just incredible. So, Who did Jade eliminate? Becky Lynch. Technically, she she. Naomi, I believe, kicked Becky Lynch off the apron, if I'm not mistaken, via Jade Cargill. Oh, so she got through Naomi out. So she got like the assist. Surprisingly, that was the only two. Jade Cargill only had two eliminations. It was Nia Jax and Becky Lynch. Right. I I don't think she needs more at that point. I feel like if you were going to give her like a ton of eliminations, then she would have had to have either broken Mm -hmm. or not had to not, not either. She would have had to have broken. Is it Shayna Baszler's record? Yeah. And they did a fantastic job, by the way, with Nia Jax being in that rumble, everybody tried to eliminate her, everybody. And for weeks, we've seen this dominant force in Nia Jax, which people still refuse to like accept as her, being completely different and we see her just be dominant in the Royal Rumble I think she held the record for the most eliminations in this Rumble not total eliminations but uh, mm. nobody could do it a group of superstars could not do it Jade Cargill got right in there and boom nah. and she was able to eliminate Nia Jax I agree something else that I like was Tiffany Stratton uh, eliminated Roxanne Perez too you know the NXT yeah. sticking together but overall, Bailey picking up the victory. This was an achievement that she hasn't done yet. Um, well deserved by Bailey, and I think that this women's Royal Rumble matchup was so awesome from the booking to the surprises to the spots. This was a fun matchup to kick it off with. Yeah, this was my uh, my favorite match of the night for sure, mm-hmm. and I'm I'm very happy that Bailey won, and I hope. What I said last week, where we can see like the the downfall of damage control, and then maybe that leads to a hell in a cell. Hopefully, it is the main event of night one of WrestleMania. Yeah. After but. that, we saw Roman Reigns pick up the victory over LA Knight, Randy Orton, and AJ Styles to retain the championship. 
Uh, the three of them at the start went right after Roman Reigns. I think that's a smart decision. The match itself, though, I thought was just okay. And I think the best part of this for me was Paul Heyman's facials and his reacting to literally everything that was going on. I feel like it's difficult to do much in a fatal four-way sort of situation. Mm -hmm. So, but I like that um, Roman Reigns got hit with that BFT and, and, and LA Knight almost won the match. And then AJ I, Styles hit the Styles Clash, and he almost won the match. Everybody had their spot where you were convinced where they could have won the match. Randy Orton caught the, caught the phenomenal forearm with the RKO, and then he dropped LA Knight with an RKO. And then Roman Reigns, I don't know if he was going for a spear or something, but Randy like ran into the RKO, it seemed, kind of, which was a cool RKO. And then right when yeah. Randy Orton goes to win... Solo Sokoa pulls the referee out. And he hit Randy Orton and LA Knight with the Samoan spike. He stacked them for Roman Reigns and everyone's like, why isn't the referee counting? And they're like, well, both shoulders are down. We can't count. They explained that. Yeah. And AJ Styles moved out of the way before the barricade spot with Solo Sokoa. So Solo got taken out over there. But AJ hit the fun, phenomenal forearm on Roman Reigns, and then he also got stacked. Yada, yada, yada. We know what happened. Roman Reigns wins. I love the end where AJ Styles was about to go for the phenomenal forearm, but he jumped onto the top rope. But I, I think it was Roman Reigns pushed Randy Orton or some LA Knight. I forgot who it was. Do you remember? Some AJ Styles was going to go for the phenomenal forearm, being set up for it. He jumped onto the top rope, but then somebody hit that, and he it caused him to drop and kind of like fall into the ring where Roman Reigns was able to pick up the victory. Right. I thought that, I that was a it was, really yeah. cool uh, finish of it. You know? that, that apparently was his 999th overall match. I'm not 100% sure if that's wow. actually accurate. Wow, that's incredible. But if that's the case, if that's the case, then it seems like WrestleMania 41 will be his 1,000th match. What a and that counts. That counts like dark matches, house show, live event. What what a way to have, what a place to have your 1,000th match, right? That's if like that's accurate, incredible. But that's pretty. Yeah, that's if pretty if if accurate. But next up, you had the uh, Universal Championship on the line as Logan Paul successfully no. defeated. No, 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 United States, brother. What did I say? <laughs> Universal? Unless oh, you sorry. say United you, States and I you, heard the, Universal. Yeah, I United States Championship. Logan Paul <laughs> defeated Kevin Owens. Um, it was by DQ, but I was a huge fan of how that DQ took place. Well, I mean, the match in general, first of all, I thought was very well done. From the start where Logan Paul tried to start with a handshake... And Kevin Owens is like, absolutely not. He starts beating the hell out of Logan Paul. It was just an enjoyable match. And Logan Paul is such a good athlete. And we had really good reversals in this match. I liked when Logan Paul called Corey Graves out about nobody being able to, to suplex Kevin Owens. And Ke Corey's like, I, I always, I witnessed it myself. Nobody has superplexed Kevin Owens. And Logan Paul's like, well, I'm going to do it. And then Kevin Owens reversed it. I thought that was great. And then somebody jumped the barricade to help out Logan Paul. This was weird this. to me. This was a weird spot to me where I don't know if that was somebody that he does the podcast with. but I don't know who he was. I, they, I don't even know if they named him. I don't know if they, I no, think they, they did give him a name. They but. just said that he was a friend of Logan Paul. But I felt like this entire segment took me out of the match because of how long it took. Like, he jumped the barricade, then you had Kevin Owens distracted, but then you also had Logan Paul distracted, then you had security kind of get over there, then it just took a lot of time to get to where they wanted to get for it. I wasn't a fan of this part. Yeah, they were, yeah, they, they were kicking the guy out, and A-Town down under ran down, and Austin Theory passed Logan Paul brass knuckles, only to have Kevin Owens reverse it, Use them. Referee counts one. He counts two. 
and then sees Kevin Owens' fist and the brass knuckles and DQs Kevin Owens. And I thought that was such a brilliant spot because we rarely see the referee do that. Yeah, especially it's against a spot that doesn't make the ref look stupid. It makes the referee look super smart, especially when it's against a face such as yeah. Kevin Owens. You know, I thought yeah. that, yeah, usually that would be a, a spot where we're like, why didn't the referee see the knuckles, the knucks on his fist right there? Like he didn't put it in his trunks or anything. He still had them on. Why is that? So for the referee to actually look up and see the knucks and call it. I thought that was a smart finish. I thought that was really, really good. You know what it reminded me of? <laughs> Not hmm. that you would know the incident. It reminded me of a time in high school when I was in Spanish class. And oh, yeah. A, I lo- yeah. Uh-huh. A kid. We, we had like a glass window and a kid like banged the glass window and fell to the floor or whatever. And... The, the teacher, like, shoots up out of his desk and, like, immediately points. And that reminded me of that. But it was, like, one of those things where where uh, the, the, they were messing with the teacher. And the teacher was like, I saw, I saw the kid. The kid, they, they tried to convince the teacher that the kid had roid rage. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so, but the, the look on the, the teacher's face, like, it just connected with the, the referee doing that. But... Kevin Owens attacked Logan Paul after the match and he power bombed him through the table. So perhaps it's not done yet with Logan Paul and Kevin Owens. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Main event of the evening, we had the men's Royal Rumble matchup where we saw Cody Rhodes pick up the victory to become the fourth ever to be back-to-back Royal Rumble champions, uh, joining the likes of Hulk Hogan, Shawn Michaels, and Stone Cold Steve Austin. Was it fourth? No. Is yeah. that accurate? They won yeah. back-to-back? Yeah. It was Hulk Hogan, Shawn Michaels, and and, each, and uh, Stone Cold. Oh, and people want him to become the first ever three-time back-to-back-to-back? I don't know if people want him to. That's what I pitched to you. I don't know if people are saying that. I saw some other people saying that, but uh, the Uso started this at number one and two, which I thought was funny because Jimmy was out at number two. Naomi was number two. Yeah, I didn't They're catch a that. Real life married couple. I definitely marked out for Jimmy and Jay kicking off the Royal Rumble. What a way to get spotlight on the both of them. Maybe we are going to see uh, Uso versus Uso at WrestleMania. Yeah, I feel like we have to. I mean, they've been they've said on interviews that they want to face each other at a WrestleMania. It seems like we have to see that. I mean, there's no better time than now where you both have one as an uber face and one as an uber heel, you know? We saw Grayson Waller. Yeah, that'd be fantastic, too. Especially with the crowd involvement, with them doing the, I mean, the, I don't know what you would say, the the dance that Jey Uso does and the yeet and everything. Yeah, the, the wave. I think that, that would be a hot match for WrestleMania. Yeah. Number three was Grayson Waller. And he came out, cut a promo, making fun of Jey Uso, and then teamed with Jimmy. We saw a return at number four, that being Andrade El Idolo. Andrade, not Cien Almas. Just Andrade, but I'm super pumped that Almas is back. I, When he debuted in, in AEW, I said, hopefully he wins the AEW championship. And then he spent a majority of his AEW career off television. So I know Triple H is is in charge of this version of WWE. I hope we have a very different Andrade. And I'll talk more about him later on as well. But we saw Carmelo Hayes at number five. I liked um, Santos Escobar and Andrade. That spot I thought was really funny. Because mm-hmm. Escobar was like, oh, we're definitely going to be a team together at this point. And yeah. Almas is not having it. I thought that was cool. Like, Escobar wanted him to be a part of his faction. And Esco- and Andrade was just like, no. I thought we could it. see Carlito and Andrade work together. But that didn't happen in this match. But uh, we did see Carlito spit the apple. So I thought that was good. I thought it was cool to see um, Carlito, Dominic Mysterio, Santos Escobar, and Andrade in the ring at the same time. 
Yeah, so many multi-generational talents there. Third and, and second generation. I should have started with second. Mm-hmm. But we saw Bobby Lashley and Karrion Cross work together, which was very expected. We saw the Authors of Pain with Paul Ellering come out and the Street Profits made their way out to brawl. And everybody in that situation worked together and brawled together to the back. Um, oh, who came out with that? Finn Balor. Was it Finn Balor? Somebody came out during that segment where Finn they Balor were like, disgusted. Was I think Finn was Balor it, was, was it, Austin them? Theory, maybe. No, when, no, when no Lu- were... Ludwig Kaiser came out. Oh, yes, yes, it was Kaiser. Entrance. Yes, yes, you're right. It was, yeah, Ludwig Kaiser. The Just the looks that he was giving them, like, ugh, like, stay away <laughs> yeah. from me. Like, when he first came out, he was just, like, looking at them at the stage, like, ugh, get away from me. Like, don't even, you guys are, you are all disgusting. Yeah, obviously he didn't want to get sucked into the brawl, so. Yeah. But we saw Finn Balor make his way out in absolutely no rush to go out there and help Dominic, which I thought was really funny. (laughs) We saw Cody Rhodes come out at number 15. That was my pick. I was, I went four for four on this premium live event, by the way. There you I don't go. Know the last time that I happened. something that I marked out over, and I was telling you, Bronson Reed came out, Gunther came out, and I told you, I'm like, dude, I am gonna mark the hell out if IFR comes out next because you know how I like my my 300 pounder <laughs> matches and stuff like that. I am such a huge mark for Ivar and Reed matches, and right away, as cued, Ivar comes out. I legit marked out for Ivar because I'm like Ivar Gunther and Reed in the same room uh same ring together at the same time um it's just awesome before that happened um Bronson Reed eliminated Andrade I think that's a big elimination there yeah yeah we saw Cody Rhodes hit the crossroads to Shinsuke Nakamura which eliminated Nakamura out of the match we had a surprise but, with after that with Braun Breaker from NXT making yeah. his main roster uh, up Huge spot from him. Huge spot from him and Gunter. Yeah. Yeah, Braun then, Breaker. He, Braun Breaker was made to look like a huge star in this matchup. Yeah. And then we saw entering, what was it, number 21? 20, 21, was it? 21 was almost. I was going to say 22. McAfee. Oh, yeah, so number 22. Yeah, so 21 almost was in there. 22, Pat McAfee. And he apparently was not aware that he was going to be in that match. And I thought, people were like, oh, it's a wasted spot. The Rumble is for stuff like that. I Yeah, I agree The older you. I get, the, the more I could see spots like that. If, if, if maybe in 2011, if the 1998 Royal Rumble happened, I don't know if I don't, I, if, if the 1998 Royal Rumble happened in 2011, I don't know if I would have been a fan of Mankind, Cactus Jack, and Dude Love being in there. That makes, but I, now, I, get, I get what you're saying. Being, so, so I think that Pat McAfee being in this, on that spot, at first I was just like, Why? But then I was a big fan of it. And for people that are complaining like it's a wasted spot, who else was gonna who else would have taken that spot? It's not gonna be a surprise. Most likely, if it wasn't Pat McAfee entering there, it was gonna be Tommaso Champa, Xavier Woods. Well, hold on, it could have been a surprise. I I saw I saw a thing where I don't know if it was true, I didn't actually hear the words coming from Kevin Nash, but apparently Kevin Nash was contacted and asked to be in the rumble. I don't know if that's an accurate statement or not. I would have care to see kevin nash in there right now i would 100 you know? percent mark out for that 100 percent. what are you talking about it was cool when he showed up i think it was the 2000 was it 2011 yeah it was know. a while ago or 2000 back when the, maybe back where I think it, booker t was in 2011 back where it made no sense as to why he was trying to go after cm punk but yeah, I, I yeah, right, yeah, 2014 would have been then. I think. I think I I think that Pat McAfee was good in that spot. I think that otherwise and it, it was popped me go him to... like teasing him teasing like oh I, I don't want any part of this. I'm gonna I'm go I'm that gone. That's funny. And then oh wait, no, maybe I'll give ring. it my shot. He would get yeah. back into the ring, size up almost, and then be like, no, 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 I'm getting out of the ring. And then he actually eliminates himself. I thought that was a funny spot. I mean, there, the WWE has a large roster. There's a lot of wrestlers that didn't wrestle in the Royal Rumble matchup, and it was still phenomenal. So something that was really great was J.D. McDonough 
Um, he would. He. Oh made wait! His... Before that, before that though, yeah. Brom Breaker took out almost. He looks like a beast in, coming out of that rumble, taking out almost. Dominic Mysterio eliminated Brom Breaker. So I thought that was a, a big thing for Dominic to eliminate Braun Breaker there. And then R-Truth got in the match and he tossed J.D. McDonough in because J.D. wasn't like, I guess if R-Truth entered the ring before J.D. McDonough got out there because Braun Breaker speared the absolute hell out of J.D. McDonough. Yeah, that was a nasty spot. And if, if R-Truth entered the ring before J.D. McDonough did, then R-Truth, uh, then, then J.D. McDonough would have been eliminated. So he made I sure feel like that a JD lot of was people... not eliminated by putting JD McDonough in the Royal Rumble. However, JD McDonough was eliminated like right away from that. Yeah, three second elimination. Um, I think that with that spot, I think a lot of fans don't realize the rules. Like me and you know the rules. We know that if JD didn't enter the ring before our But they also ent- do change the rules from time to time. I know. Sometimes we're we're seeing weapons be used. I remember one time Finn Finley, Finn Finley, Fit Finley, I, was eliminated for using the shillelagh. So they do I, change the rules from time to time. But I always felt like weapons were illegal in in Royal Rumbles. I guess technically they should be. If I'm not mistaken, I want to say it was probably 2001, where they they let a lot of weapons in the match. Yeah, I'm not 100 like percent sure on that. The Dreamer Raven time. You know, but I was a big fan of uh, this JD McDonough spot. Very hilarious that with R Truth once again, R Truth being the first person ever to enter the Roman's Royal Rumble and the Men's Royal Rumble, especially on the same night. Well, well actually, not, not the first in the same night, I should say. Well, he didn't. He didn't enter the the Women's Rumble technically. That was more of a kind tie situation there. That's true. That's very. That's true. He did enter the ring, but it wasn't okay. I see what you're saying. That's true. Nia Jax is still, I believe, the first to enter both. I feel like it may have been Beth Phoenix. Oh, in the same night, you mean? Yeah. I forgot. I forgot she may have done it in the same night. Good call. But our truth got up on the apron, got a hot tag, and Dominic went for it, and I thought that was absolutely hilarious. I. The crowd reaction. It's one of those things where, like, I would never expect the crowd be to be so over for a hot tag. Crowd but in a Royal Rumble matchup, <laughs> they actually went for the hot tag. And and Dominic jumping just towards the corner to tag in R-Truth. And then R-Truth goes for the, the five-knuckle shuffle. And the commentating team, uh, Pat McAfee, Michael Cole, they totally sold all of this. Because they were saying how... And he tagged... They were, like, uh, calling it as if it was a tag team match. They were like... Our truth is now is tagged in, and he's going up. He's going for the five knuckle shuffle because he uh, looks up to his childhood uh, favorite John Cena. <laughs> Just hilarious. And then we saw we saw the awesome Truth team up in this, but our Truth saved Dominic from being eliminated based on from from Miz, yeah. and that caused some tension. Damian Priest got in, and right Ooh. away knocked our Truth out and eliminated him. That punch, he like. Just rocked him right away. I love that da- uh, Damian Priest was just on a mission. He entered the Royal... He didn't even look anywhere else. He was strictly looking at R-Truth. He gets right into the ring. Doesn't even stop. Doesn't stop or break his walk. Just continues walking straight to R-Truth and clocks him and eliminates him. I loved it. We saw CM Punk in- enter the Royal Rumble at number 27. Sami Zayn returned at number 30. And the final four in this Royal Rumble saw Drew McIntyre, Cody Rhodes, CM Punk, and Gunther. I think the one person that I didn't have in the final four was Drew McIntyre. I had Jey Uso there. Mm -hmm. But McIntyre makes sense to be there. I was very close. Punk ends up taking Drew McIntyre out. But... uh, Punk got hit with a um, Future Shock DDT and immediately held on to his arm, which we'll talk about in a moment. Yeah, there's many different spots that it could have been because there was a few times where he did grab at it, 
but this is the one that storyline wise, this is the one that did it. Well, I mean, not even storyline wise. Who knows what it was actually? Exact, exactly. Who? But storyline wise, this is what they're rolling with. No, I matter don't know what. if they. I don't remember Drew McIntyre necessarily saying that he caused the injury, though. Did he? Yeah, yeah. He's. That's why. I mean, we'll talk about it. But on Monday Night Raw, that was something that he brought up was like he did the injury, and he dreamed. Okay. Because he said that he had. He used to pray, pray. that he was the one. Yeah. You know. So. Cody eliminated Gunter. My feed, I almost cursed right there. My feed cut out right when he eliminated Gunter and we're <sighs> literally left with the final two in the goddamn match. That... I'm like, what? Are you kidding me? My heart. So, so the feed comes back on. The final two of the match was Cody and CM Punk for maybe, I want to say eight or nine minutes. And... I know people were watching that. Some people were bored. I thought it was a fantastic ending of the Raw Rumble. I thought that was great. And then, obviously, CM Punk was eliminated. And like you said, the first time in, uh, I think, 26 years, back-to-back Raw Rumble wins for Cody Rhodes. And then Cody pointed, Roman Reigns was sitting up in a suite, as was Seth Rollins. He does so the, the whole... I... The whole Elite finger gun, wolf pack, kiss, bang, bang. Points at the WrestleMania sign. Points at Roman Reigns. So I was a big fan of both Rollins and Roman Reigns being in the crowd at this moment in the suites. I was a big fan of this. But something that I would have wanted, after I saw this, I thought it would be cool if they did that with the women's match too. Or moving forward, if you had the champions in the suites, to add a little bit of something to it doesn't the mean you have to were watching the match on TV I... instead. What do you mean? EO and Rhea Ripley were watching. They were shown watching the match. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. I think that it, it just adds something to have them in the suites aspect watching the match instead of backstage watching it. I would like to see them carry over doing this for the future of Rumbles, though. Something that was a major, major talking point was how little the crowd was popping for most of the women in the Royal Rumble. And a lot of these times, men too, for, for the entrances, people were like, who the hell is this? Really? What, what theme song is playing? Yeah, the theme songs. Nobody knows these theme songs. They're terrible. Def Rebel is terrible. I you could, And there's a clip. What triggered me to say this? There's a clip of somebody, they recorded Seth Rollins, and... They're recording Seth, and Seth is, like, puzzled. Absolutely puzzled. Like, who the hell is coming out? And then he realizes. You could see, like, the face that he makes, like, oh, it's Karrion Cross. These theme songs. Uh, Karrion Cross has a great theme song. He's got a new theme song, though, I think, that's, like, not 100% Karrion Cross right off the bat. Some of these theme songs are not gettable right away. Mm-hmm. And that was something... Jade Cargill, I think she has that good, like, the beginning part with her talking. And then it's just, like, generic music. I wanted her to have, like, some sort of knockoff of, of the like, the X-Men theme or something. I thought that would be unique or something. But a lot of these theme songs are just straight-up trash. Mm-hmm. So, Yeah, I think overall, uh, Cody Rhodes picking up the victory. I thought that this match... I thought it was great, too. I was a big fan of both the women's matchup and the men's matchup. I thought that the surprises were definitely good surprises. I thought that they oh, were... Really oh, aw- nobody knew who was going to win, Cody or, or CM Punk. Come on. The, the story is there. I, How anybody I'm sorry. Anybody I disagree. Except for Cody Rhodes. Get out of here. It had Dude, to I'm be sorry. Cody I, Rhodes. It had to be that. I disagree. You can't disagree. It had to I was be watch- that. Dude, when I was watching it, I, I thought that it could have been CM Punk as well. I thought not I, at all. I thought that it could have been CM Punk 100%. And I also thought that it could have been Drew McIntyre. It would I not did. have made sense for anybody but Cody for me. I don't know. That's why we differ on opinions. I was full-fledged into it. I didn't 
I was watching it glued to it, not... Well, I'm not saying I wasn't into it. I thought that was a great ending to the no, but I. But with me, when I was watching it, I wasn't watching it with anticipation of Cody winning. I was still watching it with anticipation that I don't know who could definitively win this. Because we've seen in the past, uh, wrestlers win a Royal Rumble where it wasn't who we expected it to be. And watching this with CM Punk, Drew McIntyre, and um, Cody Rhodes... I really had moments where I was just like, I legit don't know, but I I loved the Royal Rumble match. I thought it was incredible. But I um, it, it, it was it was it was to borrow <laughs> Stardust entrance theme song title. It was written in the stars. Well, there you go. Well, it had to be Cody. I think that it was a great Royal Rumble match. I don't get the flack that people are talking about the Royal Rumble matchup. For me, it was really enjoyable. I loved it. But Yeah, I enjoyed it. And then people are like, oh, there were dull moments. It's a Royal Rumble. Of course there's dull moments. Yeah, what do you I of thought Of course that, there's there's downtimes in the in the rumbles. And and for nothing for nothing, but even the downtimes, I don't think that there was too much downtime because every single per well, I wouldn't say every single, but most people that after their entrance, they had hot feeds into them. You know? But everybody's going to have differing opinions. So let's and go on to... for the most part, we could all say that we enjoyed the Raw Rumble winner. It's not yeah. like we were... I mean, even course. look at the Final Four. If if you didn't think that Cody was going to win that Raw Rumble, the Final Four, I think, were still people you could get behind and be like, oh yeah, I'm glad they won the Raw Rumble. Instead of you flash back, it's, it's Roman Reigns and people are lifting... They're, they're booing The Rock for, for raising Roman's arm. Yeah, I I I or agree. it's Batista for some reason. Like we're it's not that we had options of of everybody would have been happy. Yeah. And I think people are for the most part happy that Cody Rhodes won. I agree with you. Well, let's continue and see where this took place and what happened with the fallout over on Monday Night Raw. Mm, Monday Night Nitro. Kick Pat it off McAfee. with Yeah, big surprise where they announced Pat McAfee was officially going to be joining the Monday Night Raw commentary team alongside uh, Michael Cole. Um, this I was how that that differs for his schedule that he wasn't able to do SmackDown, but he's able to do Raw. Yeah, I. You know what? Because he is live every single day. Yeah, and I'm happy about that. I'm happy that he is a part of the commentary team. But next up, you had CM Punk hit the ring. Everybody was talking about the injury, the injury, the injury. So CM Punk, starting off Monday Night Raw, cutting a promo, address... In a sling. In a sling. Uh, what a heartfelt promo, talking about how if you think he has a bad and starts talking about the... Or uh, talks about these other people that are just overcoming and fighting... And battling every single day from uh, his friend who's battling cancer right now to firefighter in Chicago. And he is really, he's he's watered up, teary-eyed, talking about all of this. And really, I don't know about you, Brandon, but I fully got behind CM Punk during this promo where I'm like, wow, I want to see him have his WrestleMania moment now. I thought this was well done. Yeah, he, he came out and he confirmed that he tore his tricep and he needs surgery. And then, like we said before, McIntyre showed up. He interrupted. And he's like, I can relate to you. And he said that he's not been a spiritual person. But he prayed for this to happen to CM Punk and it happened. He targeted CM Punk. And he couldn't let CM Punk win the Raw Rumble. Yeah. And, and he said he, he'll find he... his way into the title match at WrestleMania and live... CM Punk's dream again. Uh, I, I, I thought that Drew McIntyre in this promo was incredible, and you know you had CM Drew Punk. McIntyre even on Twitter on TikTok using all these memes, these hurtful memes to stick it to CM. Punk. I mean, yeah, he was working out his triceps in the TikTok video. <laughs> Like, Drew McIntyre is being such an uber heel where it's incredible. You have CM Punk comparing... It, like, it was so heartfelt. He was talking about comparing to himself to the Chicago Cubs 
And he's saying how, you know what? He's always dreamed of being, having this WrestleMania moment, but maybe it's just not meant for him. Maybe it's just not meant to be... Maybe he's not meant to have a WrestleMania moment. And for Drew McIntyre to tell him... But he said when he comes back, he will go to WrestleMania, but first he's coming for Drew McIntyre. Yeah. And then McIntyre went for a cheap shot and Punk ducked it, tried to fight back, okay. but Drew McIntyre put him down. What's I know your, you aren't... What? Hold on. I don't. I don't Pause. know how he used the broken, tar, the torn tricep. Okay. Arm. Yes. Pause. Real quick. Pause. What is your feeling about CM Punk throwing punches with the injured arm? Can it be more injured? Is it a Cody situation? How does that work? I mean, once it's torn, it's you know. But I didn't like. I didn't like that CM Punk actually tried to get offense in there. And I didn't like that Drew McIntyre was selling the offense of a bad arm. I didn't like that part. I thought that it I was really... I don't mind it, though. It's like he's doing... I, I he didn't... literally just had Drew McIntyre in his face say, I did this. I prayed for this I to know, happen. But it I... happened. Bam. Effing if, roasted. If it was going to be anything, I'd rather it be kicks and left hands instead of that right I, injury. I don't know. I mean, the arm do is in a sleeve. all you can do. I'm not... I wasn't a fan of that. And I thought if, and it, I think, if it was I feel like his... we saw Cody do the same thing. Unless I'm mistaken. I know Cody, when he was injured, he got taken out in one of those angles too. I don't know um, if he fought back you know, when I think Seth I, took him out. I don't recall. But then you had Drew McIntyre stomp on the tricep. Uh, and then you had Sami Zayn come out to make the save. I feel like I don't know. Maybe it shouldn't. I feel like it shouldn't even gotten that far for Sami Zayn to come out to make the save. Like before he even stomps on the tricep, Sami Zayn should have hit the ring. Yeah, but you need a reason why CM Punk is out further than he is, or because you guess. don't know with the timetable for CM Punk right now. Yeah, it could be so four to CM six Punk months. Punk returns. If CM Punk returns in nine months or whatever, it's like, oh well, he got his tricep stomped on by Drew McIntyre. Yeah, yeah, that's true. So we That's saw true. the Judgment Day. Rhea Ripley said that Monday Night Raw is about sending a message that wasn't sent at, at the Raw Rumble. And Damien Priest said that they're done with distractions. We saw DIY have that fired up walking to the, to the ring promo. And then we get to the match for the Tag Team Championships, the Judgment Day successfully retain the titles against DIY. The crowd was super into this and were actually chanting for DIY, which I definitely was surprised to hear given how we haven't really seen that big of a push Mm -hmm. of DIY. Like there's been a push of DIY, but there hasn't been like that big of a a crowd connection push. Yeah. I was, I was a fan I, I was a fan of the DIY promo cut on the way to the ring. And I really, I didn't, I definitely did not think that DIY was going to win this match at all, but they got a lot in and had a lot of spots that made it look like they could win. So mm. I like the fact that we got that. After the match, we saw the Judgment Day celebrate. Dominic Mysterio and JD McDonough ran down. And then Damian Priest said that they all owe our truth an apology. And he called our truth out. And Damian Priest was like, listen, truth, I'm not going to attack you. And then truth was like, I forget what exactly he said, but he's like, you're like an older brother to me, which I thought was really, really funny. Cause Priest mm-hmm. is like, bro, you're older than me. <laughs> mm-hmm. But Damian Priest said, you're, you're just not part of the group. Yeah. And then he called for, I guess he called, did he call for Dominic to do it? And then JD McDonough yeah, well, jumped him instead. He was just like, I mean, Priest, his entire, pre- he was just like, I am not going to do this to you. And then he was just like, Dom is. And then Dom may, started to move towards, like started to move, but JD just jumped right onto our truth and started pounding and pounding and pounding him. So... And then Miz ran down to try to make the save, and he got got as well. And I thought we were going to see some sort of big surprise there, but that didn't take place. 
Yeah. But now it seems like as far as WrestleMania goes with Damian Priest and Finn Balor, kind of seems like we're going to see Awesome Truth versus Judgment Day for the titles. Unless that takes place at Elimination Chamber. I can see that maybe Unless at Elimination Chamber. At but on the other hand, I'm not ready to see our truth detached from Judgment Day. I think it happened. Uh, it was just a misunderstanding. I, there's no, like, hey, <laughs> I don't know what kind of misunderstanding that is. I mean, he's gotten <laughs> beaten up before and said that it was all just a uh, Yeah, but initiation. this time, I feel like it's, this time's different. I don't know. I guess we're going to there, find there's out. There's got to be a segment next week where Miz is like having that heart to heart with him. And he's like, bro, you have to know. Mm-hmm. After that, we saw Zoe Stark and Shayna Baszler pick up the victory over Piper Niven and Chelsea Green. Not really much taking place in this match, but it, it was what I expected it to be. And I enjoyed the match. Yeah. I, there, you know, it was enjoyable, but didn't really... It was good. It was good. But next up you had Cody Rhodes. It was Shayna and, and, and Zoe that needed the victory here. So, Yeah, 100%. Uh, Chelsea and Piper don't need the victory. They're already solid over. But next up you had the Royal Rumble winner, Cody Rhodes, in the ring cutting a promo. I loved how he just took it all in and said, you know what? I want you to announce that again. And gets announced again. And the crowd goes crazy, super, super babyface promo, only to be interrupted well, by Seth just, Rollins. It wasn't even much of a promo. He was just literally about to say who he was picking. Yeah. And then Seth interrupted, and he said that if you choose Roman Reigns, you're making a mistake. He said he's the guy. You don't want Roman Reigns. You want me. I'm the guy. Mm -hmm. And the World Heavyweight Championship is the title. To me, it sounded like Seth Rollins was begging for this. And to me, it lowers the value of the title. I did not like that part of the segment at all. And it ends with Cody saying he'll think about it. The story is the WWE Championship. Cody, that's why the whole thing when that title was made. That, that match, it made no sense. Why would Cody Rhodes be in that tournament? It's not the title he wants. It's a speed bump. I don't care if it's the quote-unquote Hulk Hogan title. Mm-hmm. That's the title he wanted. That's the one championship that Dusty Rhodes thought he won at Madison Square Garden in September, I think, of 1977 against superstar Billy Graham. Countout victory. Dusty Rhodes, obviously, in a countout, you don't get the championship. Yeah. it's ha- It has to be that title. And Cody said he's going to SmackDown, which I'll obviously talk about in a moment as well. But it had to be, it has to be Roman Reigns versus Cody. Seth Rollins just comes off as begging and, and pleading. It's not Cody that needs the match. It's Seth that needs that match. Yeah, to me, it seemed like Seth came off like a little bit desperate. Like he needs to prove to himself that he's a champion by defeating Cody Rhodes, who he Cody is three and zero against him. Exactly. Yeah, it's Cody that does not need that. It's Seth that needs that match. Mm-hmm. Boo hoo, Seth! Not gonna happen. <laughs> <laughs> we saw Jay Uso pick up the victory over Bronson Reed. I like this match. I really, 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 really wanted Bronson Reed to win this, though. I didn't think he was going to win this, but I really wanted him to win this. Because Bronson Reed, I think, is the one that needs victories. Jey Uso's already that made man. You know what? I I agree with you. It's hard to see Jey Uso lose right now because he's so over. But I totally agree with you that Reed needs to be viewed as dominant and dominant means picking up the victories. Yeah. After that backstage, we had Andrade return to Monday Night Raw where he signed a contract with Adam Pierce. Nick Aldis walked in 
And Andrade told him to say hello to Zelina for him, which I like that little nod because you thought maybe Andrade could be going to SmackDown where he just very easily joins the LWO. Very happy that did not happen. And I'm happy that we got that little nod to Zelina Vega and their former partnership. And, uh, and I'm glad that Andrade is on Monday Night Raw. And then Nick Aldis said that they have to discuss the Elimination Chamber. And then he got a phone call from Braun Breaker. So it seems like when Braun Breaker comes to the main roster, it will be for SmackDown. Yeah. That might have already happened. I don't know. We're in the past. (laughs) In the future, I'll talk about it if it happens. After that, we saw Becky Lynch. She was interviewed and she said that she can't give up. And right now, Plan B is just training fighting and maybe a little bit of cheating until she gets back into the main event. So I think WrestleMania, we could potentially see Rhea Ripley versus Becky Lynch versus Nia Jax. Potentially. I'm pretty Hmm. solidified on Bailey versus EO sky. So I wouldn't, I don't know. I wouldn't unless it is see. just going to be Becky Lynch versus uh, versus Rhea Ripley. We don't know what the Elimination Chamber holds yet. I don't know. That's interesting because uh, in my mind, I'm I don't know because Be- Nia Jax defeated Becky Lynch. In my mind, Becky Lynch needs to Nia defeat. Jax. Nia Jax uh, did she not also defeat Rhea Ripley or or did she, that she beat the hell out of Rhea she Ripley? Beat the crap out of her on Monday Night Raw. That's why I could see potential match for WrestleMania being a triple threat between the three of them. Huh. All right. I could... Unless you get Nia Jax versus Becky Lynch at Elimination Chamber, and then you have Nia Jax go on to face off against... uh, I think we'll see... I think we'll see Rhea Ripley in probably the main event of Elimination Chamber, given that it's in Australia. How's this... In a singles match... And I think we'll see a, a number one contender elimination chamber match for the for the championship that Rhea Ripley holds. Where do you see? I think Jade, we could. Where do you see Jade Card? Sorry to interrupt you. Where do you see Jade Cargill fitting in? I don't see Jade Cargill right now at all. And if she's going to be anywhere, I think it seems likely that it would be on Monday Night Raw. But I don't know. Yeah. Huh. That's but the thing. I'm I like, think we could see. You, you don't see her another at Rumble, though, match. do you? Say I mean, again? I'm sorry. You don't see her in a WrestleMania match? Jade Cargill. I don't know. That's a tough call. A lot of people are saying, oh, she would be great to have inside an Elimination Chamber match where she's fighting for the opportunity to face Rhea Ripley. I mean, she would have to be, like, it would have to be a Shayna Baszler kind of a... No, it doesn't. I don't think it has you... to necessarily be that. She dominated Nia Jax, but I don't think it necessarily has to be a Shayna Baszler. I don't think we'll ever see a Shayna Baszler moment again. Okay. Hmm. But, but I don't know if she'll have a WrestleMania match. I, I, just, I don't know. There's so many outcomes. So many things that could happen. But, but the, only, I could, the only chamber matches that I see would be number one contender and for the tag team championships. Yeah, that makes sense. But next up, you had Gunther pick up the victory over Kofi Kingston to retain the championship. It should be noted that Kofi Kingston did not have a Royal Rumble spot. Um, no. the Kofi Kingston spot. I don't know if that was. I think. Yeah, I think two of two of the years that he's tried them, he's he's not uh, had them, and I know people are disappointed with it. But well, it's not that I'm fine with him not. I think last year and and the year before, I believe, because there was that one where he got injured on one of them, and then the other one, I yeah. think they jumped onto like the chair and the chair moved. Yeah, and the chair fell over. Yeah, right. Yeah, so yeah. maybe a safe. The Maybe other one, there was another that... one. I think that he he landed on the barricade, but his feet, his foot fell. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. No, you're right. You're right. Yeah, you're absolutely right. So honestly, with that being said, the smart move is not to have the Kofi Kingston spot this year. Give it a rest. You could always have a comeback the year after because if he goes for it, it doesn't land it. What then? That's come on. So I think that I think it's good not to have it. But this matchup was this was a good match. Gunter controlled a lot of this match. Kofi 
took over at one point. They did a barricade spot with the steps. He hit the boom drop from the top rope. But Gunter eventually took over and and took Kofi Kingston out. And then Imperium jumped Xavier Woods after the match to the point where I'm like, Big E's returning right now. That wasn't the case. Mm-hmm. But it seems, I, I feel like, I, I I thought for sure we were going to get Gunther's WrestleMania match out of the Royal Rumble. And that didn't happen. So, I'm still, like, I, obviously we don't know where Big E's at. He was all over the Royal Rumble event. Not the event itself, but like all the events surrounding the Royal Rumble. Mm-hmm. We don't know if he's in ring shape, obviously. His, like, neck, if, if he's good to go. But that's obviously one branch they could go with the Intercontinental Championship. Like I said, I think two weeks ago, like Chris Sweat, Chris said last week. So whether that happens, I don't know. Maybe, maybe we'll get a, an Intercontinental Championship gauntlet match. First match, Gunther absolutely kills Honky Tonk Man. Second match, we get... Somebody, third match, fourth match, and then boom, finally Big E is there and dethrones him or something. I don't know. Mm -hmm. We saw the Kabuki Warriors pick up the victory over Natalia and Tegan Knox. I forgot to mention in the Women's Royal Rumble, I liked that spot where uh, they, it's like, did Natalia try to eliminate Tegan Knox and then Tegan actually took out Natalia? I think that's what happened. I like that spot where it's like, teacher student sort of thing Mm -hmm. but as far as this match goes they should have just defended the titles i feel like they should have just defended the titles and i understand why bailey wasn't ringside but i feel like all of damage control should have been ringside and i feel like if damage control was ringside the crowd would have been way more into this match than they were natalia tried her absolute hardest to get that crowd involved and they were just barely given anything back yeah. So totally that was that was an unfortunate part of the match. There, there's also that spot with uh, Natty asking Tegan for that tag, and Tegan didn't listen. She went after Kyrie Sane instead. So I, I think they're doing that like teacher student sort of thing there between the two of them, where it's like, well, if you listen to me, maybe we would have won, and then maybe we would have gotten a title shot, but that didn't happen. But Katana Chance and Caden Carter have a rematch for those tri- the, the tag team titles against Damage Control next week. And then we follow this up with Bailey, And she took credit for everything that the group has accomplished, which she's not wrong. Since they came together at SummerSlam, Bailey has been the person pulling the strings behind everybody. Regardless of her... I, I bar- bailey has got any, barely any wins. Yeah. But we saw Rhea Ripley come out. Nia Jax attacked her, like you said. They ended up fighting in the ring, and Nia Jax beat the absolute hell out of Rhea Ripley here. All all the while, damage control, they're backed up in the corner. They eventually, all four of them leave, and Bailey's left there by herself in the ring while Nia Jax walked towards her. And she said, you could pick Io or anyone else. Rhea Ripley's not making it to WrestleMania. And then that's when Bailey said she'll make the announcement on SmackDown. So maybe we'll see it be Nia Jax versus Rhea Ripley at, at Elimination Chamber. Uh, that could be a match. And then it's Becky Lynch that wins the number one contender spot for Becky versus Rhea at WrestleMania. I could see that. I could see that. But yeah. Main event of the evening. Main event. We had Drew McIntyre pick up the victory over Sami Zayn. Um, this match stemming from everything that took place earlier in the night. But not even, because this was a scheduled match. I, they, I feel like they tried to sell it as such. This was a scheduled match for Monday Night Raw. Mm-hmm. Based on, I think, McIntyre injured Sami Zayn a few weeks ago. Yeah. But Drew McIntyre controlled a lot of this match. And we saw Sammy kept fighting back every single time. 
And McIntyre just got more and more annoyed. And then I liked, there was an accidental low blow spot where Sammy went for the Huluva kick. Mm -hmm. McIntyre literally just dropped down and and X'd over his face to cover up his face. And then Sammy ran into his hands. I thought that was a great spot. Yeah, just That doesn't put the blame on, yeah, and it doesn't put the blame on McIntyre for actually doing the low blow. It puts the blame on Sammy Zayn for running into it. And then Drew McIntyre hit the Claymore to win off of that. I thought that was a great, great way to end that match. Yeah, I totally agree with you. Moving over to NXT, we saw Carmelo Hayes and Trick Williams pick up the victory over the LWO to make it to the finals of the Dusty Classic. They'll be facing the Wolf Dogs. We'll talk about that in a moment. The very beginning of this, we saw Carmelo Hayes' music cut off Trick's music. And then it eventually goes back into it, this garbage remix version of it. But, like, that, the fans booed. Carmelo Hayes' music cutting off Trick's theme. And I think that's going to add a lot to... If what happens... If what I think ha- will happen at Vengeance Day... Fans are going to eat it up for WrestleMania for Stand and Deliver. Mm-hmm. It's going to be fantastic. I agree. But they packed so much into this match... Which I would have liked it if it was longer... I feel like they did a lot more than they needed to in this little amount, of, not a little amount of time, but there was a lot packed into it. The, uh, the double bookend spot from trick I thought was great. The, um, Carmelo Hayes even bless him for trying to get out of that tree of woe when he was just tied up waiting for the LWO to hit their moves. I feel like we almost never see somebody struggling to get out of the tree of woe. They just wait for that move to happen. Yeah. So I, I really like that. And then this match ends with a, a great knee from Trick to, to pick up that victory. I agree with you. I think it's a huge victory. And I'm interested to see what the Dusty Finals is going to entail with Melo and Trick with everything that's taking place with them. Will they be able to coexist? Is Melo going to turn on Trick? Is he going to turn on him during the match or after the match? It's- yeah, and then we saw uh, Obafemi attack the LWO. Dragon Lee made the save, and Obafemi overpowered all three of them. And that that sets up the the match for Vengeance Day between the two of them. And then we saw the Wolf Dogs later on, and and Corbin was like, you know, it would have been nice to know you were going to be in the Royal Rumble. And Corbin referred to them as the Wolf Dogs, and Braun Breaker pointed out he's all super happy about that. I thought that was funny, too, because he was very against it the other week. Yeah. And then we see Lyra Valkyria and Tatum Paxley backstage, and she asked Tatum why she attacked Roxanne last week, and Tatum's like, you wanted me to. And Lyra's like, that's not at all what I wanted you to do. And then we fast forward, Roxanne Perez picks up the victory over Tatum Paxley, started during the commercial break. I still enjoyed the match. It wasn't super long. It, the main focus of this, though, was Tatum trying to do everything for Lyra and Lyra not wanting it. Mm-hmm. And then Tatum Paxley tried to attack Roxanne Perez after. Roxanne Perez gets the upper hand and Lyra pulled Roxanne Perez off. And Tatum Paxley's like, you saved me. So that adds between Tatum and, and Lyra Valkyria. Yeah. Next time, next up, you had Lola Vice pick up the victory over Electra Lopez. Um, this matchup was it didn't I don't know it didn't do too much for me. I thought this was it a very was well a good wet match. It was it was very well put, but I think I was just maybe tired. I don't know. I would have liked a little bit more aggression at the start. Not to say there wasn't aggression there because mm-hmm. it like started right away. But I enjoy this. And and Lola Vice obviously needed that victory. And I think that yeah. uh, Electra Lopez still comes out looking strong here. Yeah. Next up, you had, had Dijak, Dijak and Joe Gacy Joe... backstage battling. Um, they were battling all over. You had security trying to break them up, break them up. And then you had Dijak and Joe Gacy. They were like on top of a roof. And Dijak... Is it a truck? Yeah, it was like on top of a roof or a truck. 
And then Dijak just like, what, he tossed Joe Gacy off? Uh, into the into a dumpster. And then Ava yelled at Dijak. And Dijak's like, I want a no DQ match for Vengeance Day. And Ava's like, no. Joe Gacy pops up out of the dumpster. He goes, oh, that sounds like fun. So that gets <laughs> set up. Earlier in the night, we saw Ava and Ridge, though. And he wanted a match by himself against Gallus, and she said, absolutely not. And Lexus King came in. He dropped off a welcome basket for her, which featured items of his, which was really funny. And then she put him in the match with Ridge. She's like, Merry Christmas, and gave Ridge the basket. And Ridge was like, re-gift, and gave it back to King. And I thought that was really funny. And then we fast forward to the match. Lexus King gets the victory over Ridge Holland. And because we because Ridge wanted all three members of Gallus, I thought we'd see this match over much sooner than it was. Mm-hmm. But Gallus showed up and Ridge took them out. Lexus King took advantage of that and got the victory off of that. And then yeah. Gallus jumped Ridge Holland afterwards and they smashed his foot in a chair. There really is nobody there for Ridge Holland. No, nobody's going to come save him. But next up, you had Chase U addressing everything in the ring. They are broke. They have no money. They have no funds. They have no idea what they are going to be doing. But wait, not before that, long. the students put together a tribute video. And they used Tell oh, Me yes. a Lie, which was absolutely hilarious. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, then JC Jane and Thea Hell showed up. And JC laid out all the positives that Andre Chase has done and thought about how she could change. He helped Duke Hudson change. She, he helped me change. So she helped Chase U survive. She got a 2024 Ladies of Chase U calendar and said it'll save Chase U from debt and beyond. And everybody was marking out over it. Yeah, and then they celebrated backstage and Lexus King interrupted. So we'll probably see Lexus King and, R- and Riley Osborne sometime soon. Yeah. Next up, you had Ariana Grace pick up the victory over Fallon Henley. Based on the earlier segment, I thought this was going to be Ren Sinclair wrestling Fal- uh, Ariana Grace. Mm-hmm. but uh, And then I also thought there was no way in hell that Fallon Henley was losing this. But Metaphor showed up. They cheated. They took her out. And Booker T, I thought, was hilarious, pretending to not see that that happened. Mm -hmm. That metaphor did that. Ariana Grace, after she got the victory, was shocked. And I thought that was also funny. So I I enjoyed that. We saw Noam Dar pick up the victory over Von Wagner to retain the Heritage Cup. Noam Dar got the first fall in round two after Oro Mensa caused a distraction. We saw Lash Legend and Jakara also try to cheat. But but Fallon Henley and Ren Sinclair ran down and brawled with them to the back, so I assume that's getting set up for a tag match. Yeah, probably and I thought week. I thought Von Wagner would tie it up in round four, but Noam Dar got that jackknife pin on Von Wagner after he missed a corner move and he got that victory. Yeah. But we saw Noam Wagner Dar and the Oro Mensa. Hand. They got in in the faces of Stone's kids after, and Von yeah. Wagner attacked him for doing that. Cleared off the commentary. Yeah, Von Wagner and, getting the uh, upper hand. Yeah, he put Oro Mensa through the table. Yeah. And then closing so. out NXT, we saw Ilya Dragon off and Trick Williams in a face to face where Trick accused Ilya of playing him the whole time. And Dragon off said like. My body was destroyed and the medical staff would not clear me to wrestle. And he also said that he thinks Trick is clearly not focused as he doesn't even know who to trust. Mm -hmm. And their rivalry made him more of the man than he is today than Carmelo Hayes has. Which I thought was good back and forth between Trick and I thought it was good between between, uh, Ilya Dragunov as well. Mm Mm-hmm. Yeah, and for then sure. Dragon off hit one of that those signature hugs, and the wolf dogs attacked. And I was surprised to see Ilya down for that whole thing and not help out. Yeah, he was totally taken out. You know, 
But I think that's the perfect way that leads right to Vengeance Day. I agree. Uh, Talking about Vengeance Day taking place on Sunday in Clarksville, Tennessee at the F&M Bank Arena. This Sunday, how about some predictions? Let's go with Dijak taking on Joe Gacy in a no DQs match. I'm going to... I'm going to go with Joe Gacy. Yeah, I think it's going to be Joe Gacy as well. All right. Six-man mixed tag team match. The family. Six D'Angelo. Person. Yeah, person. Uh, D'Angelo, Lorenzo, Rizzo taking on OTM. I'm going to go with the family. Yeah, I don't think OTM should be winning that. They no. definitely need wins, but I don't think they should be winning that one. Yeah, I feel like the family has too much going for them. Yeah, for the Dusty Rhodes Tag Team Classic, I feel like the match, this will open up the show. I feel like the Wolf Dogs taking on Trick and Carmelo Hayes has to be Trick and Carmelo Hayes. I agree. I'm going Trick Mellow Gang. I feel like has they're going to get that W. Yeah. NXT North American Championship on the line. Oba oh, Femi picking up the victory over Dragon Lee. I'm calling it right now. Yeah, he didn't even say versus. He said pick, picking up the victory. I'm agreeing. Oba oh, Femi's yeah. getting that win. Uh, the NXT then, Women's Championship on the line. Larry Valkyria taking on Roxanne Perez. I'm going Valkyria. Lyra. Yeah, Lyra's winning that one. And then the, the main event, presumably. NXT Championship on the line. Ilya Dragunov taking on Trick Williams. Carmelo Hayes cost Trick Williams the match. Has to happen. Triple H moment. Closed circuit TV. Black and white grainy footage. Boom. It was Trick. It was Trick all along. Not Trick. Carmelo. Yeah, I'm going to agree with you. I think Dragunov is going to pick up the victory, and this is where we're getting the payoff. Absolutely. I agree. Fingers crossed, at least. Yeah. We'll see. So those are predictions for NXT Vengeance Day. Moving over to SmackDown. Logan Paul opened up the show, and he said that he underestimated Kevin Owens and said Kevin Owens did more damage to him than Floyd Mayweather did, but he still lost. And then Kevin Owens came out and said that it's still his goal to take that title from from, uh, Logan Paul. And Logan Paul said that the brass knuckles were a bait sort of situation, and Kevin Kevin Owens took the bait. And then Kevin Owens put the referee over, which I thought was funny. Um, But Logan Paul said that he's going to find a real challenger for that title. Then he went and did commentary for Kevin's match where Kevin Owens picked up the victory over Austin Theory. Ton of good reversals in this match. Some good false finishes as well. But Grayson Waller got involved so Logan Paul could pass brass knuckles to Austin Theory. Kevin Owens intercepted them. And he ended up using those brass knuckles. This time the referee didn't see and Kevin Owens got that victory. We saw British Strong Style pick up the victory over LWO, Legato Del Fantasma, and Pretty Deadly to advance in a Raw and SmackDown number one contender thing. They also aired a segment for Legato before this match, which I liked. We saw Joaquin Wilde hit that big uh, springboard dive to the outside like we saw in NXT. Uh, Electra Lopez and Zelina Vega got involved. And I like that twin magic spot from Pretty Deadly. But British Strong Style definitely needed this win here. And we'll see who wins on Monday Night Raw. The winners will face off and then go on to Elimination Chamber to face the Judgment Day. We saw Bailey earlier in the night. She overheard damage control laughing at her. And EO said Bailey is done tonight. And Bailey looked sad. And then we go to the ring and Bailey said that she only got to where she is because of damage control. But sometimes the people who you thought were your friends, you have to go and prove them wrong. And then Bailey spoke Japanese and said she knows that they've all been laughing at her behind her back. She's been there for years. She knows she's not stupid. And all she wanted was to take them to the top. And we saw a lot of, we heard a lot of Bailey chants here. And then they surrounded Bailey, and Kabuki Warriors jumped her from behind. Eo Sky jumped her. Dakota Kai was not here, but Adam Pierce saw all of this coming, and he just motioned to Nick Aldis to further like push a feud between them. He's like, "Eh, it's your, 
It's your brand. Look at your brand. They're falling apart right in front of you. And Bailey got a pipe from under the ring. She took out the Kabuki Warriors. And she stopped right before she hit Io. But she chose Io for WrestleMania. So please give me that Hell in a Cell main event. Please. After that, Bobby Lashley and the Street Profits were supposed to face off against the Final Testament. But that didn't happen. And I would have been surprised if the match actually happened because it has premium live event written all over it. And they basically just continued their brawl from the Royal Rumble. And we saw Scarlett get involved. BFAB, finally, after weeks, maybe probably even months, BFAB shows up and takes her down and helps the Street Profits and Bobby Lashley come out on top. So finally there's payoff there. I'm looking forward to... Whatever happens with them next, maybe it's a four-on-four at the Elimination Chamber. Maybe not. I don't know. Backstage, we saw Braun Breaker where uh, he was looking over a contract with Nick Aldis. And Adam Pearce walked in and said, oh, you should probably come to Monday Night Raw and talk to me before you sign that. And Braun Breaker agreed. And then Jade Cargill showed up. And... (laughs) Nick Aldis was super pissed off at Adam Pierce and told him to leave. I really do hope we get Adam Pierce versus Nick Aldis. The main event of SmackDown saw Tiffany Stratton pick up the victory over Mia Yim. Earlier in the night saw Naomi officially sign with SmackDown, but it also saw Tiffany Stratton officially sign to SmackDown. And then she got in Bianca Belair's face and said she's not afraid to step up to the best. And then slapped... Mia Yim in the face. Like, slap the hell out of Mia Yim. We also saw Bianca Belair and Logan Paul kind of get into it because of that spot. But uh, I thought the match was good. I think it's cool to see Tiffany Stratton in the main event in her first SmackDown. Um, And she hit the prettiest moonsault ever to pick up that victory. So I'm, I'm happy with that. After that was the big WrestleMania decision. And we have the bloodline come out. And Roman Reigns addressed what Seth Rollins said on Monday Night Raw. And said that he beat everybody who competed for that title. So they're all number two. And I thought that was good banter about Seth Rollins. And then he said he's not going to beg Cody like Seth Rollins did. You can either be number two or take a crack at number one. And then Cody came out. Asked if they could have the ring to themselves. And Cody said that he knows he had Roman Reigns. And he thinks Roman knows it as well. And he disagreed with what Seth said about calling the WWE Championship a Hollywood title or whatever. As it's still the title that Bruno had. It's still the title that his father almost won. Like I said before. And then Cody said that he still wants that title. But he's not taking it at WrestleMania as he took counsel with someone who knows Roman very well and then brought The Rock out. The Rock says something to Cody. They shake hands. And then The Rock just stares down Roman Reigns to close SmackDown. What a deflating segment to me. And I feel like I should be on the highest of highs for a Rock versus Roman Reigns match. But I I put everything behind Cody Rhodes and Roman Reigns. And Cody winning that title from Roman Reigns at WrestleMania in the main event. So, if not WrestleMania, does that mean... I have to wake up at 5 a.m. to see Cody Rhodes versus Roman Reigns at Elimination Chamber? Is that going to happen at the Chamber or is it not happening? That left absolutely no answers and I'm very disappointed that that match is not seemingly not going to take place at WrestleMania. But that SmackDown going to take a quick Break right now, and I'll be right back here on Marking Out. Yo, 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 yo. 
Yo, yo, it's your boy JTG, and you're listening to Marking Out. Wait for it. Wait for it. Cheer! Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen, to Marking Out, episode 678. Moving to AEW Rampage from last week, we had Mox pick up the victory over Lee Moriarty. This was definitely the best match from Rampage. I think my favorite part of this match was that hammerlock on the apron from Lee Moriarty. But uh, Shane Taylor attacked John Moxley after the match, and it sets up Collision, where we saw the Blackpool Combat Club pick up the victory over Shane Taylor Promotions. I wish this match took place on Dynamite instead of Collision, because I don't like having so many back-to-back matches with Rampage and Collision. I feel like there's no time to let it sink in. Like we just saw the setup on Rampage. Fast forward to the next night. It's like it happens so often. And it's not even the only time that happened. But the match started as a ringside brawl. And in the end, John Moxley choked Shane Taylor out to pick up that victory. Back on Rampage, we saw Takesh to pick up the victory over Christopher Daniels. This was really nothing. It was good for Takesh to, That's the point of the match. The family is still feuding with Chris Jericho. And Kyle Fletcher wanted a match with Chris Jericho. I'll speak about that in a moment. We saw Anna J pick up the victory over Ruby Soho. Angelo Parker... Before the match, asked Anna Jay if she had anything to do with Harley Cameron the other week. So she slapped him. Uh, The match, we see her and and Ruby Soho brawl outside before the match. I'm glad that Anna Jay won this. I think the storyline is stupid. I think it brings everybody in this down. So I just think it's nice that Anna Jay got a victory there. We saw Commander pick up the victory over Butcher, Kip Sabian, and Vikingo to get a title shot. I liked the Tower of Doom spot in this because Kip ended up mailboxing the Butcher, which I feel like is a unique spot that I don't know if we've seen before. In my memory, at least, I don't know if we've seen a Tree of Woe, not a Tree of Woe, uh, a Tower of Doom spot like that. But the ending for me sucked. Commander reversed a move from Kip and then Kip threw his legs up for the pin and didn't even try to kick out. So I really didn't like that and I might as well mention the match for Collision. We saw Orange Cassidy pick up the victory over Commander to retain the championship. And just like that Blackpool Combat Club match, I would have preferred for this to be on Dynamite or something. There's no room to breathe between Rampage and Collision for this match. It was a good match. Commander ended up taking Undisputed Kingdom out, but that led to Orange Cassidy getting the victory. And then Roddy dropped the title on the map before he handed it to Orange Cassidy. Collision, we saw Mariah May pick up the victory over Lady Frost, which I really think it did more to showcase Lady Frost than it did Mariah May which is not the point of this match. Mariah May is supposed to be the one that's that's being built up, but all the flashy moves and everything was coming from Lady Frost. After that, we saw Eddie Kingston pick up the victory over Willie Mack. If Eddie was going to win this match, I don't understand why it would have to be a proving ground match. I never understand the point of that. Just make Eddie the fighting champion. His character would be the one to be willing to to literally take any fight and put the titles on the line. He put the titles on the line in in that tournament. So why not in a random match against Willie Mack? That doesn't make sense to me. And then the next match, we saw Brian Danielson pick up the victory over Yuji Nagata, which was crazy to see. Absolutely meaningless, though. Storyline-wise, there's nothing there. Did it happen because Eddie Kingston likes Japanese wrestling? Eddie sat on commentary for this. Obviously, he's feuding with Brian Danielson. But there's no story there. 
And like I keep saying, it's like an indie wrestling match. It's just a, an indie wrestling event. There's no meaning to these matches whatsoever. They're really good matches. But for TV, for an actual storyline, I would like for there, for there to be a storyline attached to it. And I think it could have been better had there been storyline. We saw Serena D pick up the victory over Robin Renegade. Very nice to see Serena D back. Also nice to see Robin Renegade used. I think it's crazy that Serena Deeb has been out that long. And obviously she was going to win. But she cut a promo afterwards saying that she's there to elevate the women's division. She's there to put wrestling back in all elite wrestling. And she's back to be champion. Main event saw FTR and Daniel Garcia, kind of. Almost not Daniel Garcia. This was a confusing one. The actual result was Garcia. They picked up the victory over House of Black in an Escape the Cage match. It was elimination and then the wording changed and it went, became a huge topic of debate. The graphic was changed. The wording was changed. The rules were apparently always Escape the Cage, but... That makes absolutely no sense to me here. But backstage earlier on on Collision, Daniel Garcia was laid out in a bloody mess. Fast forward, Mark Briscoe offered to step up for, for the team. Fast forward to the match, House of Black takes Mark Briscoe out. And somehow the bell rang before any of them entered the cage. So as far as I'm concerned... Mark Briscoe was in that match. But I did not understand that match beginning with nobody in the actual cage. But fast forward again, Daniel Garcia makes his way out. And I was honestly very confused by all of this. I know so many people were like, oh, this was the best cage match. This was such a great match. It was four on three. Even though Mark Briscoe was taken out, the, the bell rang. There were three on three at the time. Garcia can't be in the match. Somehow finds his way into the match. And this was the match that I was most looking forward to. Why would either team want to escape the cage? They're having a blood feud. And they want to be fighting each other. Why would they escape? And then once they escape, they're out of the cage. They just stood there and stopped caring about fighting. How did that, I don't understand how any of that made sense at all. I I did not like that at all. It made no sense. AEW Dynamite, though, kicked off with John Moxley picking up the victory over Jeff Hardy based on the match that Jeff Hardy had the other week with Swerve. I thought I was going to enjoy this a bit more than his other matches in AEW, but that wasn't the case. They spent a ton of time outside of the ring. The referee couldn't care less that they were out there. Mox ended up in the crowd at one point and the CMLL guys ended up pushing John Moxley. There was no DQ there. The bigger part of this was that the Luchadors jumped the barricade afterwards and beat John Moxley down. And Blackpool Combat Club wasn't there to back him up. But it was Mystico, Mascara Dorado, uh, Hechicero, and Volador Jr. Mascarada Dorado is not Grand Metallic, by the way. It's a different one. So we get a whole bunch of setups with them for Rampage, Collision, and I, th- I think Rampage. And uh, I think Dynamite next week. Maybe not Rampage, just Collision and Dynamite next week. We saw Hangman pick up the victory over Toa Leona. Since 2021, Toa Leona has not won or had many singles matches in AEW. And the matches that he has had are mainly losses. And I understand that it's somebody from the Mogul Embassy and that's why it would make sense for Swerve to pick him. But it doesn't make sense for Swerve to pick him versus someone like Brian Cage who actually has singles victories. 
And then fast forward to this match. We saw Toa Leona no sell the dead eye. He ducks the buckshot lariat. Lariat? The lariat. And then still loses the match. That's so goofy. What does that do for Toa? They they were just the, the ROH trios tag team champions. And then randomly got that AEW trios tag title match. What does this do for him? It does nothing for him. And I don't it doesn't do anything for, for Hangman either. Just because of the guy's size? He's almost win he's almost winless. We saw Wardlow pick up the victory over Commander. This was too long of a match. And I don't think Commander should have been put in this match. And either way, for me, Wardlow looks stupid at times. And doesn't come off as someone who could dethrone Samoa Joe. And it seemed like Wardlow got injured in this. So hopefully he's okay. I have not read anything, any updates about that. The main story here, though. Undisputed Kingdom goes to attack Commander afterwards and the best friends come out. Roddy wants that title from Orange Cassidy. And then Wardlow, they're building him up. But how's this building him up? He literally went from being a monster to nothing. And now he's still nothing. We saw a sit-down interview with Tony Schiavone, Sting and Darby Allin, Big Bill and Ricky Starks. This... It really felt like a knockoff of Degrassi. And I don't know how to explain it in any other terms but that Sting and Darby Allen are obviously winning the tag titles next week on Dynamite. This was just not a good segment. And then you follow it up. Chris Jericho picks up the victory over Kyle Fletcher. I think a lot of people, myself included, just want this feud to be over. Like, I can't even begin to think what the endgame is without Kenny Omega being there. Powerhouse got involved. Don Callis got involved. And then Chris Jericho, obviously, he's winning this. Takesh just showed up afterwards to stare Chris Jericho down. And I hope it ends next week with Takesh winning. We saw the Bullet Club Gold and the Acclaim come out, which was a completely pointless segment. It felt like one of those Raw reunion segments, except nobody from NXT got buried. Nothing in this segment furthered any storylines with anyone except for a cardboard cutout of Juice Robinson. This was completely pointless. We saw Deanna Perrazzo pick up the victory over Taya Valkyrie. Tony Storm was on commentary. They aired a video package of Deanna explaining why the tattoo she showed off last week was meaningful. And that all of her tattoos have different meanings. Something that Bully Ray last week said should have happened. And I agree with that. And so many people jumped down his throat calling him stupid. And said, oh, don't you watch the product? They explained everything. Which was not the case at all. Obviously not. Even more so since they aired this. So I'm glad that they explained everything and followed up with that. But it should have been last week. Tony Storm was on commentary here, and I think it worked against the match, big time. And I feel like the match should have been more than what it was. They missed the end of the match because they spent more time focusing on Tony Storm. And a lot of the match, they spent time talking about upcoming matches, upcoming shows, and Tony Storm. So I think that really took away from what this match could have been. And like I said, they missed the ending. The most important part of the match. Main event saw Swerve pick up the victory over Rob Van Dam. Samoa Joe did commentary. Hangman made this a hardcore match. It was one of those pick your poison matches or whatever they called it. Um, Just like Hangman versus Toa Leona was. Very, very standard Rob Van Dam match. We saw Brian Cage get involved. Hook showed up to brawl with him to the back. Swerve versus Jeff Hardy was such a more enjoyable match than this was. And I found myself bored with a lot of this main event. 
It was just the same typical Rob Van Dam stuff in 2024 Rob Van Dam stuff. You throw a chair, you do the leg drop, you do the, the rolling thunder, you miss a frog splash. Obviously, Swerve was winning that. And then Hangman came out afterwards to speak about the rankings, which they brought back after Dynamite. And they're all wrong. This end of the show felt like it would have been something that they would open the show with. And now we'll see Hangman versus Swerve next week. But all of the rankings, most of the rankings are like all out of order where it makes no sense. I don't understand. Swerve showed up on Dynamite this week saying 4-0. and You go to the website before the rankings come out, Hangman and Swerve both said 4-0. and Where are those four matches from? Now they're 4-0. and So that was annoying because you're trying to mathematically figure out everything and go back in the records and see where did this come from. And then you go to the women's division, Chris Statlander's 3-0. and Deanna Perrazzo's 3-0. and On her, her AEW nameplate, it said, I think it said 2-1 for 2024. Not the case at all. So, she's 3-0, and she's 3-0. and Thunder Rosa, 3-0. and Chris Statlander's not even in the rankings. Sky Blue, I think, has uh, less, less victories than Mariah May. And Mariah May is, is further down on the rankings than Sky Blue is. That doesn't make sense. You go to the tag division, John Silver and Alex Reynolds have one trios tag victory on TV. That's it. They have dark matches, but how could you include dark matches in this one? We're literally not seeing dark matches anymore. There's no AEW dark. It doesn't exist. So I assume they're counting those, but that makes no sense to count them in a ranking. We're not seeing it. So all of these division rankings are so out of everything. Also, the main thing between Hangman and Swerve, we're tied. We have three wins. We have four wins now, each of us. And yet somehow Swerve is number one and Hangman's number two? Edge is 5-0. and oh, And he's ranked lower than both of them. That makes absolutely no sense. I hated the rankings when they were here. A lot of people were like, oh, thank God the rankings are back. I don't know why. It's just this, it's the same thing over and over again now. And night one, you had, you had weeks you announced it whenever you did. It's now February. You had you had the whole month of January to work through the 2024 records. And somehow it's still wrong. Unless I'm just a moron. And I don't think that's the case. But that's Dynamite. That's AEW. Hey, Brandon. Got any shout outs? This is Droopy Dog, and you're listening to Brandon's Shoutout. Julia gets the first shoutout. It came out in 2022 on HBO Max, and then the second season was on Max, and they unfortunately canceled it the other week. It's a series based on Julia Child, and if you like Julia Child, and if you like uh, the other projects made about her, I think you'll enjoy this. But I, I'm... Beyond late to the party in watching this. And I think it's too bad that they canceled it. Sarah Lancashire plays Julia. David Hyde Pierce plays her husband. B.B. Newworth is in it. So it's cool to see them two in the cast together. Both seasons are on Max for now at least. I don't know if it's going anywhere. So check it out for now. Um, The Greatest Night in Pop gets the second shout out. It's a new documentary on Netflix about the recording of We Are the World. I wish they had absolutely everybody that they could who could still participate, participate in interviews, but that didn't happen. But it was still really Mm -hmm. cool to see how the song was made. And it's crazy that Lionel Richie went from literally hosting the American Music Awards and then darts over in a car to... The, the record studio where they're doing it, where Michael Jackson was there recording his part. 
And then all the celebrities slowly but surely start showing up to record there. He was with Quincy Jones. But uh, the... That's wild. Yeah, it was absolutely crazy. And the whole reason why they were able to have all these famous singers together was because of the AMAs. Springsteen flew in special for it. He just finished the tour the night before and flew in special for that. Dionne Warwick, I think they said, uh, flew in special for it. But the amount of time that these artists spent in that studio to get it all done in one night is crazy. And if you like documentaries, check it out. It's really cool. I, I think that was a really good... I very much so enjoyed this documentary. Then the last shout-out goes to everybody that supported Mark and Out over these past 13 years. Even if you stopped listening to the show or you hate listening to the show, thank you. You listened to the show. I appreciate it. I appreciate all the support that we've gotten. I appreciate Nick Matocho for our logo. I appreciate Ring Rope Rebellion for our theme music. All the wrestlers that have helped us out in the past. Thank you. Truly, truly appreciate yes, it. Yes, I... I thankful for chris for coming up with the idea yeah, absolutely. to start marking out as well you know without chris saying let's do a podcast we wouldn't be doing this many yeah. moons ago brandon used to just hang out on a couch and not not even not that say was anything. one time i think it was like the third or fourth episode you asked me any thoughts on dolph ziggler i'm like he's good yeah yeah and yeah. then slowly but surely it's I, I started calling in doing shout outs i think jimmy <laughs> fallon might have been one of the first shout outs if you know, you know. Yeah. Well, thank you, everybody, for uh, supporting us. Yeah, and those are my shout-outs. Now it's time for our... Our... Mark Out Moment of the Week. That is right, our Mark Out Moment of the Week. And speaking of Jimmy Fallon, by the way, Rewind to last Friday for The Tonight Show. You had Dwayne Wade and Ken Jong playing a game that they play called Phone Booth where you answer trivia questions. And based on if you get it right or wrong, somebody gets added to the opponent's phone booth. Cody Rhodes was one of the guests being yeah, used to be stuffed one. in. Yeah, so and full gear. And it was funny to see Ken Jong just like mark out. Yeah, because, I mean, they obviously know each other, so I think that was cool to see. And he's obviously a big wrestling fan. Yeah, he's a big mark. I mean, so that, that was really cool. Also, this is not related, but it was WrestleMania season. Gritty was one of the guests as well. <laughs> so I think that's funny. <laughs> oh, yeah, that's true. Um, that's true. Uh, something I, I marked out for so much in the Royal Rumble. I marked out for Jade Cargill, Jordan Grace, the R-Truth Naomi. spots. Yeah, big Naomi. time. Naomi. Andrade. Also, before the um, Royal Rumble, Bailey Ron showed Breaker. up to the arena wearing a like it seemed like a Macho Man robe jacket, and she was wearing a La Parka mask bag. And I thought that was really cool. And like on, I think it was Sunday. I want to say a bunch of the whole timeline was like a bunch of retweets from La Parka or L.A. Park at this point. Now that's cool. <laughs> yeah, so I thought that was yeah. cool. Also during the media scrum. Uh, DDP asked a question to Cody and I thought that was really cool given their relationship and there was footage that came out after the fact of DDP yeah, that was, celebrating the victory with Cody. Yeah, that was a really special question and everything like that was definitely really cool. Yeah. And then also on uh, Saturday Night Live that aired going against the Royal Rumble kind of uh, Justin Timberlake and Jimmy Fallon did the Barry Gibb talk show and that when when they announced that Justin Timberlake was going to be the musical guest, that's what I had hoped for. So I, I popped at them doing the actual Barry Gibb talk show there. So I was very mm. pleased with SNL. Uh, those are the mark out moments of the week. And that is episode 678, our 13th anniversary. Again, thank you so much for listening. You could check us out on Twitter at Mark and Out. On Facebook at Marking Out, YouTube and Instagram, Marking Out 11, Pro Wrestling Tees.com slash Marking Out, TikTok at Marking Out, Apple Podcasts, Amazon Podcasts, Spotify Podcasts, YouTube now as well, Marking Out.com. Of course, you can follow each host, BTTG161, Chris Sween Dog, CM Sween 85, David PTDPT, and we wish you the. the- Best. Best.
best of luck in your future endeavors. Have a fantastic week.